Hi, today's class is around sport and media. Um, that's what we're going to be talking today and the influence that media has overall in regards to sports. So let's get started. The traditional media uh, that covered sport was newspaper and magazines, radio and television. This is from the late 1800s into the 1900s until things started to change. Um, but if we look back at traditional old ancient times, like for example, in Rome, um, you had the heralds. The heralds would communicate the, the events that happened in the Colosseum. Um, in today's modern age, things have changed and the new media sources are internet and websites. Um, you got video streaming, you got social media, blogs and podcasts. So let's look at internet and websites. Um, your traditional sports organizations like let's say Auckland Rugby, County's Manukau Rugby Union, your rugby club could be Pakaranga Rugby Club, or it could be the Netball Center, the Auckland Netball Center. They have a website where they produce information in regards to their sport and code. Um, First 15s and, and schools and, and, and premier netball teams also have a space on the school websites today where information is being provided to the community in regards to that sporting code. So, for example, if we look at an Epson girls grammar, um, 1500 girls in their role. Uh, that is their initial audience with the information that they're providing in regards to the, um, the how the netball team is doing, their premier netball team is doing. If we add that that school, that each girl in that school has two parents, we've now gone to 4,500 people as a target audience. If we add siblings and extended family and friends, we could be looking at a school like Epson Girls that you have seven to 9,000 uh, followers or, or target audience members that will be following what is happening in regards to the content that you're producing for the premier netball team from Epson Girls Grammar. So that's how big today uh, media is and how dispersed it is across different outlets. So that is an example of internet and websites. Then we can look at um, professional sports like the Blues, like the Crusaders, like the um, Golden State Warriors, like the Patriots, like the LA Dodgers, like uh, major sports teams in the world. They also have their own websites where they are producing the content and the media and they're letting you know as public what it is that they're doing, what it is that they're focusing on. Video streaming um, is, is coming in to replace what has been traditional television. Um, if we consider that in 2019, uh, Sky Sports in New Zealand has lost the rights to broadcast the Rugby World Cup, is just a, a showing to you that how video streaming has become the way to go and is becoming strongly the way to go in regards to um, communication of sporting events. So we have that through, um, now for the Rugby World Cup, we'll have Spark, which will be the, the 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 streamer of the rugby world cup to us um we have uh world rugby for example that streams all the games from the sevens and um and regional competitions that happen uh in regards to tests um we have in basketball that um, the basketball association of auckland they stream the games that are happening in their local competition so Video streaming and the possibility of having this technology available for different organizations to produce their own video streaming is coming to replace television. So this is something that you need to keep an eye on as you go into the to the sport world and the sports management world is what content that you are producing, what games that you are involved in will be actually video streamed as a way of producing a media outlet. Um, social media is what we traditionally think of when it comes to um, to media nowadays, but please understand that social media is just one of the outlets that you have. Uh, you have your internet, you have websites, because you have websites like TV One that might be covering the news and, and things that are happening with your particular team. You have video streaming that you might be producing or another agency might be producing for you. And then you have social media. If we think of the four main players in social media, we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. How do you integrate that into your social media management? Um, 
more and more as we go into this modern age, where companies and organizations, including sports organizations, they have what they call media managers. And, um, and a big job that they have is managing the content that is produced by them through as an organization to go out into the that social media space where people interact. Uh, something really important to consider in regards to social media versus video streaming and the internet websites is the fact that your audience has a chance to respond to the po post. So you have a post and then you have all those responses that come underneath. Um, that allows your audience to actually have a voice as well and you have to be careful for example if you're the blues and you're you've been you've had a losing season what is that dialogue that your audience is having in there we do want to listen to it but we do we want that voice of that audience to become the content that you're trying to deliver or do you want that your post to be the content. So that's what it comes to in terms of managing the, the media and the content that's coming out. And then uh, another, another category of new media that we have nowadays are blogs and podcasts. So any one of you, you might have a specific sport that you are keen on, you can start a blog and you start analyzing it. Uh, I'll use the example of, uh, of Jaron. Jaron, uh, his sport is basketball and he's really knowledgeable about basketball. We might start the Jinduk blog on basketball. And as students, you might be interested in going to read Jaron's blog more than reading something in the Herald or reading something in NBA.com because it's you're closer. You have a connection with Jaron, so that opinion will be more important. So blogs have gained a space in that sense because they tie people together around someone that you have an affinity to or you are closer to. Similar thing as a podcast. Um, one of the, the 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 biggest hitting podcasts at the moment is Joe Rogan, and we know that he has a space in the MMA space. And his opinions and the people that he brings in there, they have become in to replace what have been the traditional radio shows. So back in the late 1800s or early 1900s in the United States, radio was the way to experience baseball. Uh, people would sit behind their radios and imagine the game from the storytelling of how the commentators would talk about that game and what was happening and then you you would have until this day like we have um, radio sport here in New Zealand you have these radio hosts that talk and analyze the game and talk about the things that are happening around the game well today the podcasts just like the blogs allow any person that is interested or has an affinity with the sport to start their own podcast slash radio show that is online that people will access. So that again becomes a major media outlet. So what major players are doing, like major sports teams are doing or, 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 or sports broadcasters are doing, is that they're trying to integrate all these new medias into their traditional forms. But we have to understand when we're managing a team, when we're managing a sport organization, that we have chosen what media outlet we will be using and then what tools within it so we can actually manage the content that we are providing because that speaks of the image and the type of organization that we are. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, behind the scenes, in these past 40 years, what we've had is a major player in regards to sports media, which has been ESPN. In this video, you will, you will listen and see the work and the transition that ESPN has had to do over the past 40 years. Um, before ESPN, there was no network, no television channel that only concentrated on one type of content like sport. After ESPN came the likes of CNN that only concentrate on news, for example. But what they have managed to generate in the last 40 years is that there is one outlet that concentrates just one genre of, uh, of content, which would be sport. But the beauty of ESPN is that they have been able to create a product out of sport that goes beyond the, just the game and the athlete. They have created multiple stories around it. But in this video, we'll also see how they have had to adapt to technology and what new technologies provide them um, so they can stay up to, up to task. Um, 
a, a, a great thing to pay, uh, pay attention to when you watch this video will be that at the end at the end of the video they talk about how everybody has a chance now to record and how ESPN has the necessity to be on top of the game and be there where the new greatest thing in sport has happened and then they need to have the capacity to generate multiple stories out of it that is what ESPN is doing now watch this video and then go on to the to the next slide well moving on to the next slide here uh, there's an activity that has been done in class, but please do it on your own. Uh, look at the following websites. Uh, the first website is the Blues versus the Crusaders. The next two websites I want you to look at are provincial organizations, which are Auckland Rugby and County's Manukau Rugby Union. And then look at AFL New Zealand. Uh, I've included AFL New Zealand here because they are a much smaller organization with a sport that is not well known in New Zealand. And I also have uh, a pretty active participation with them. And that's why I know that they are very active in regards to creating content for the website. Um, one of their uh, staff members is, the, his responsibility is to create content and they have a, schedule, a scheduled system of what content goes up on their website and through their media outlets, which is social media, at different times during the week. So for example, when I manage um, uh, the a premiership team at, for AFL New Zealand, the Central Giants, uh, at the end of the game with the coach, we need to provide information to AFL New Zealand of which were our top six players for that game. Why do we communicate uh, those top six players? Because those top six players go to AFL New Zealand and every single team communicates, the four teams that compete in the Premiership communicate their top six players. That allows AFL New Zealand on the Tuesday afternoon to name the team of the week. So has AFL New Zealand had um, scouts out there looking at the games to provide the team of the week? Actually, no. What they've done is they have a system of collecting information that then they funnel and put it through a format on a scheduled time during the week when they provide that content through their media outlets. And to their captive audience, for example, which are the players, which are paying players, they pay to play, it's a, it's a, it's a user pay sport, they're waiting to see their name on this team of the week. They're waiting to see the match report on the Monday and see if there's a mention. They're waiting to see the photos that come from the game all this is content that's being produced to service their user and clients and to also create uh, a sensation of a very active organization, which is AFL New Zealand. So look at that case study, which is looking at their website, aflnz.co.nz, but also look at the Blues versus the Crusaders, compare them. Look at Auckland Rugby versus Manukau Rugby Union, compare them. Uh, I want you to pay close attention to how they're communicating with their audience. Who do you feel is their target audience? Would you look at counties versus Auckland? Um, do you feel targeted? Who are they targeting? Think about that one. And look closely at what information is being provided and how easily and accessible you feel that information is. And finally, um, try to come to a, an opinion of the different websites. What fits the mold better? What serves the purpose of that organization better? What's your feel? What website were you more attractive to and why? Um, so this is an exercise because when you are in a role in sports management, uh, in today's world, you will have to be managing content, managing these media outlets, and you need to understand who your target audience is and what other organizations are doing that work or don't work so you can actually create a better way of communicating this content through the media. Moving on to our next slide. Um, here we have um, a, a brief conversation of, of people that are involved uh, with extreme sports, like those X-game guys. And, and these are what we call 
people that are involved in media that do storytelling very well. When I say you create content around your sport, that's what entertains us. Remember, sport exists because it's an outlet to everyday life. And the people that consume sport are people that want to either practice it or want to be engaged and experience it through catharsis. Catharsis is, I want to feel what the other one is feeling. So how well we are telling the story of what's happening with that athlete, with that team, is how strongly I'm feeling it. And that is the role of the media. That is what we want to convey through our sports management of the media. Uh, these guys will be talking to you about uh, how it happens in extreme sports and the power of storytelling. And for example, ESPN does the storytelling uh, quite well. Um, I could also go in depth and talk about my, my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law was a snowboarder. He lived between Europe and South America. He, for about eight or nine years, he had no summer because all he was doing was snowboarding and eventually went on to uh, create a production company, which is a videoing company in South America that started around snowboarding. He was actually going out and filming these snowboarders because these snowboarders, the way that they make money is through sponsorship. By the, what they do is so cool that they sell their footage to companies like Quicksilver that get behind them and put money to for them to actually be snowboarding all day. You know, that's how it works in that area. So the storytelling and how they market themselves is very important. So that's how my brother-in-law got started and he's eventually gone on to pr produce, to have a video uh, video company where they do everything from weddings to um, to managing athletes and their public image through uh, video and, and, and media. So this video will be very important in terms of understanding that concept of storytelling. Uh, sports media needs to have a story and the best organizations will connect that story from what they're trying to achieve as an organization, as a sport organization, to the actions that they're doing. They should be able to connect the dots through that storytelling. So how do sports communication managers use social media? Social media now being the go-to tool many times. Well, first of all, you got to prioritize what's the right social network for your audience. Uh, maybe you're managing a county's badminton and and you and you really love uh, using Snapchat but Snapchat not might not be your social media uh, go-to you might want to just rely on your Twitter account okay uh, choosing your right social media tools will re be really important today there are more and more platforms where you can actually have um, the management of all your social media just by one application and just goes thrown out to all the outlets and you can embed that into your website those are tools that you will need to um, bring forward and, and use when you are in a role of managing a, a sports organization the other thing is what we've just talked about is creating a distinct story and 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 you want to voice success sport is fun sport is engaging so we don't want tragedy um, so it's usually success and if there is tragedy how we overcame that that tragedy all right um, so that way we build a really strong sports brand and um, and that strong sports brand is like Nike. Uh, we heard it in the previous video. Nike is probably the greatest storyteller in sports. And they've built a strong brand behind their storytelling. Uh, currently, their, their biggest uh, story or product in, in America is Colin Kaepernick, the former quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers. He's not actually playing. He's been cut. Remember, he was kneeling during the national anthem. No team in the NFL hires him. But... He is an awesome story. Uh, Nike's picked him up, and now there's a Colin Kaepernick um, uh, line of products for Nike. So that's how important it is. But because sport is a game, and that game you can't play without players, your players, and in some cases, your coaches, are really important. So in regards to your the, the media that you are actually um using and the, and the content and stories that you're pulling out, you need to leverage your players. You need to use stories that are coming out of your players and managers. Um, Sonny Bill Williams is um, a distinct figure in that case. So he, he's, he's always something interesting happening around him, whether you like him or not. In football, you have the Jose Mourinho's, the coach. Um, he hasn't been that successful in the past few seasons. He's jumped around clubs, but 
he brings a media attention because he's able to create a story and, and it's easy to create a story around their persona. And that's really important because that keeps your, um, your, your, your media content healthy and keeps your uh, viewers and your target audience engaged. And then very important, you want to collect feedback and use that feedback um, to so you can continue to deliver to your customers, to your clients, to your viewers, what they're interested in. So if I'm the Auckland Netball Center and I have a, a Facebook page and the, the, I keep on getting feedback that um, when are your when are your um, draws going to be up for Saturday? When are your draws going to be up for Saturdays? Well, I need to use that feedback and and have come out with a solution, an announcement uh, on my Facebook page, on my web page, and everything across, and saying uh, draws as of next week will be on our page on Thursday afternoons. And you process manage what's happening in your organization and then you're you're you need to fill that every thursday afternoon that's when the draws are up and people know that they can direct themselves to a certain place then they'll see it you don't have to you don't have to be responding to your clientele and how do you achieve that because you've listened to your customers your users your your players and you incorporate that feedback in terms of the content that you're producing for them. So that's really, really important. Uh, you have to be careful with social media, especially because people can reply to posts and those replies to posts can generate a whole negative wave. So this is where that management is really important. Many times social media pages allow you to post stories but not collect comments. You need to know at what stage of your, you are within your organization because that will allow you to actually secure that you have the right message going out there. And um, finally, um, I, I'll sum it up on in regards to the ethical issues in the current uh, current sport media, and it's probably been it's always been there, but especially with that freedom that people have now, that anybody can be a media outlet, anybody can grab their phone and video, anybody can actually go out there and then put something on their social media and it can go viral. Um, we need to actually be very critical of the source. Where is this story? Where is this content coming from? Okay, who is posting it up? And as me, if media managers for sport organizations, you need to be a strong source and you need to be a credible source. And if you have it like AFL New Zealand, that you have it, you have a process management in place where you have certain type of media content coming out every week, you are now the first source of information, the go-to source of information. So that's really, really important. Um, because if you get uh, a general, uh, general Joe blog posting something about a competition, it can be distorted and taken out of context. And that's where it's important for, for example, um, players to have their own web page so they can communicate Oh, I didn't say that. It's actually this is what I feel, etc. Or sports organizations to do the same. Uh, then the content. Um, what content do you want to communicate? Um, maybe the Blues are not having a very successful season. So the content that you want to produce is not how they've lost every single game, but about all the interaction that they've been having with the community and how the players are going out and participating in the community. Maybe you really want to overload it in regards to that because that's going to show success rather than how they're playing. Um, but you have to be very, very uh, sensitive that some of the content can be damaging. And some of the content might not be appropriate because you have to keep it in line with what is your vision as an organization. All right. Um, for example, you you, you have a, a netball center, and you have a netball competition. Um, you're not going to be posting up photos uh, of, of the players and saying, look how good our netball players look on Saturday. It might not be ethically appropriate to make that kind of uh, comment and post that type of content up on on your website or social media pages. So you gotta be very, uh, very careful in regards to that. Finally, you also have to consider that you're working with people. And when we're working with people, we're working with people with 
diverse backgrounds, diverse ethnic backgrounds, diverse ages. You might be working with youth. So the, 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 the situation of privacy, um, touching upon ethical backgrounds, um, it might it might be very delicate. So you got to be conscious of this situation. So when you produce your content, it's in line with the background and the people that you're actually working with. And, and finally, delivery, how you are delivering it. Um, you might have social media outlets, but you know what? It might not be the best thing to do Snapchatting or to do um, uh, Facebook Lives. Why? because you want to be a little bit more cautious and edit the um, the content that's coming out. But maybe you have a fixed um, camera on an, in an angle of the of two of the courts at the netball center. So through two of your accounts, you can actually be streaming the games. And that delivery could be done on Facebook Live. But you might not want to use Facebook Live when you're doing a prize giving because you don't know what, what one of those coaches might say. And that might be the wrong content uh, that is going to be posted up. And you didn't choose the right delivery because the content was still there. But you can actually take it, tweak it, and put it in a different way if you deliver it through, for example, your web page. We had um, – these were the winners, and these three coaches spoke at the – uh, prize giving. You've still stuck to the content, but you've delivered it in a different way and it's had a different impact than if you Facebook Live and you had, uh, for example, one of the coaches use the F word and suddenly that becomes the whole uh, focus of the, of, of the content rather than, hey, that we had three successful teams. So uh, in, a, in a very quickish uh, snapshot, that has been the topic of sports media. If you have any questions, um, please uh, send us a, a Facebook message to Daz or myself, or go um, or go to the Canvas and and start a, and start a discussion. Cool. Thanks, guys.